Hello, AP Environmental Science class. All right, now we are back here to part two of my lecture on chapter seven, species interactions, ecological succession, and population control. So in part one, we basically talked about species interactions or the way that species interact with one another. And now uh, part two of this lecture will focus on ecological succession and population control. So how do communities and ecosystems respond to changing environmental conditions? Well, that's what ecological succession is. Ecological succession is the normally gradual change in structure and species composition in a given system. So that's how communities and ecosystems respond through this ecological succession. Now, there are two uh, ecological successions that you're going to have to know about. One is called primary and the other one is called secondary ecological succession. So primary ecological succession involves the gradual establishment of communities in lifeless areas. Uh, need to build up fertile soil or aquatic sediments to support plant community. Uh, pioneer species such as lichens or mosses uh, actually start that process. So primary ecological succession basically means starting from scratch. Okay, starting from nothing, meaning you have no soil present to, uh, to start uh, growing plants. Okay, so primary ecological succession, here it is. All right, uh, you'll notice it starts with exposed rocks. Okay, lichens and mosses then uh, develop or grow on these rocks and the acid uh, in the lichens and the mosses, they actually are slightly acidic, begin to break down the rock. This is how soil forms, if you remember back from your earth science days. Okay, so what happens is the lichens and the mosses then take this exposed rock and they begin to break it down and it begins to form soil. Then you get small herbs and shrubs that begin to grow in the soil. Again, you can't have big trees yet because the soil is not that deep. So you get these uh, smaller herbs, smaller shrubs that begin to grow uh, in that soil. That then makes the soil deeper, right? As we, uh, we turn to those horizons uh, that you learned about in earth science. Then you have something called a heath mat, which again continues, all right, this eat this primary ecological succession. Finally, uh, pine, bruce, aspen trees, and then you finally get to your mature forest, uh, the balsam, fir, paper birch, etc., etc. All right, so again, uh, this is uh, what primary ecological succession is all about. And again, primary ecological succession starts from bare rock, no soil. It's like starting from scratch. And then over the course of many, many years, you go from that exposed rocks to a mature forest. In an aquatic system, okay, primary ecological succession is very similar, okay? You have a lake bed here that has no sediment buildup on the bottom. So what happens is nutrients flow into the lake, soil leaves and decaying matter sink to the bottom, and eventually they decompose and form the sediment at the bottom of the lake. Uh, then what happens is the lake ends up filling up okay, with all that sediment, and then you get grasses and shrubs to form on top of that, and there, therefore the lake goes away, and you end up having, uh, you end up having just a land there with trees, grasses, and so on and so forth, all right? So this is how primary ecological succession would, would happen in an, in an aquatic system, all right? No sediment at the lake, sediment builds up, uh, builds up so much that eventually the lake fills in. The second or other type of ecological succession we need to talk about is secondary ecological succession. This is when a series of terrestrial communities or ecosystems develop in places with soil or sediment, okay? So in secondary ecological succession, the soil or sediment is already there. We don't have to create it by weathering down those rocks with the mosses and, and, and the uh, lichens, right? So examples would be an abandoned farmland, maybe a burned or cut forest, right? After a forest fire, you basically get secondary ecological succession and flooded land, okay? A land gets flooded, the floodwaters recede, it may have destroyed the land, but you still have soil there, okay? And so again, these are examples of secondary ecological succession when you have the soil already there, uh, and then you go on and you, and you grow from there. Factors affecting the rate, all right? Facilitation of area by one species for another. Uh, this uh, inhibition actually hinders growth. Okay, so here is your secondary ecological succession, okay? And this is actually the natural restoration of disturbed land on an abandoned in farmland in North Carolina. This whole process took about 150 to 200 years, okay? So 
What do we have? The farmland was abandoned, but again, there was soil present. So that's why this is considered secondary ecological succession. All right, you get weeds to grow in that soil, then perennial weeds and grasses, then your shrubs and your small pine seedlings, then your young pine forest, and then finally your mature oak and hickory forest as the uh, succession continues. All right, so definitely understand primary versus secondary succession, all right, the differences um, and kind of the basic steps along the way. So is there a balance of nature? Like with this succession, what does that mean? So the traditional view was that ecological succession proceeds to a stable climax community. Uh, and this is basically an equilibrium, which calls called the balance of nature. So going back to the previous slide, what that means is that ecological succession continues. We get to this stable, mature uh, community here, right? The mature oak and hickory forest, and then things are kind of e equilibrium, right? We don't see a change one way or another. Things are kind of equal, and that mature oak and hickory forest kind of lives on its life until some something else happens to uh, disturb it. Some outside influence disturbs it. That, however, is not the view we have now. We've kind of refined this view of the balance of nature. And the current view is that secession actually leads to a more complex, diverse, and resilient ecosystem that can withstand changes if not too large or too sudden. Now, it may sound very similar to the traditional view, but there is a, a major nuance in why it's different. The current view doesn't believe in equilibrium. It doesn't say that the succession gets to a mature stable and then that's it. What it's saying is that succession leads to more complex, diverse, and resilient ecosystems that are constantly evolving still, okay? And they can withstand changes if not too large or too sudden. So we, we do away with this stable climax community, and we say that succession leads to a community that's more complex, more diverse, more resilient than maybe the... the uh, uh, the, the part before. So like, for instance, uh, small shrubs and, and small pine leaves would have less biodiversity than a young pine forest, which would have less biodiversity than a mature oak and hickory forest. So as the succession continues, we get a more complex, diverse, and therefore resilient ecosystem. So again, that's the current view. Uh, compared to the traditional view. I know they sound kind of the same, but again, there is that little nuance. So definitely understand it. Living systems are sustained through constant change. So a couple of terms. Inertia is the ability of a living system to survive moderate disturbances. And resilience is the ability of a living system to be restored through secondary succession after a moderate disturbance. So uh, a more resilient uh, system or ecosystem, right, would have a better chance of being restored through secondary succession than maybe an ecosystem that doesn't have that much resiliency, okay? And that's what those terms mean when it comes to sustaining living systems through constant change. All right, so that is your ecological succession. So now we talk about limits in the growth of populations that may be uh, encompassing these ecosystems. So what is a population? It is a group of interbreeding individuals of the same species. Population size may increase, decrease, or remain the same in response to changing environmental conditions. Uh, scientists use sampling techniques to estimate the population size of, of certain species. Population distribution. Most populations live together in clumps or groups. I'm going to show you three uh, common population distributions in just a second, but most populations live together in clumps or groups. So think about human beings, right? You don't have human beings living on their own randomly around, right? Most human beings come together, lives, live in towns, live in cities, right? These are clumping or groups of individuals. Uh, organisms cluster for resources. So for instance, uh, the city, right, will have have better sewer, right? Better uh, um, 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 maybe uh, areas to buy food, things like that. So they cluster, human beings will cluster for resources and also protection from predators. We don't necessarily have to worry about that as humans, but let's say the antelope, right? The antelope lives together in clumps to protect itself from the lion that is trying to kill the antelope, okay? So again, protection from predators. Variables that govern the change in population size, there are four 
births, debts, immigration, and emigration. I'm sure you know what birth and debts are. Immigration is uh, organisms coming into uh, a, a certain ecosystem. And emigration is organisms that are leaving or move out uh, of a certain uh, ecosystem or a certain area. Age structure uh, is the distribution of individuals among various age groups, and we have three, pre-reproductive, reproductive, and post-reproductive. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit more uh, in, in some subsequent chapters here, but this begins to think about uh, population, what governs population size, and again, the age structure of uh, the uh, organisms that are in a certain population. All right, so these are the three general general habitat dispersion patterns for most of the organisms on the planet. Once again, you have clumped, which is most organisms do do A, do the clumped, okay? And there, again, I, I used humans. Uh, here are the example are elephants, right? Elephants live together in herds. They share common resources, right? They help raise, raise the young uh, so that they help each other out and also helps them uh, with predators to protect. Uh, there's a uniform distribution, all right? This certain type of bush here uh, in the in this uh, in this desert, uh, you'll notice uniform, meaning they're kind of in rows, okay? They're uniformly placed. And then there's random distribution like dandelions, right? Those dandelion seeds go out, you blow, maybe you blow them, right? And they go out all over the place and they just randomly land wherever they are and the new dandelion will grow from there, all right? So these are the three general habitat dispersion patterns, clumped, uniform, random, with most organisms on the planet doing the A, uh, doing the clumped uh, dispersion uh, pattern. Okay, so just a couple of critical concepts to talk about how our population sampled. Uh, character, uh, characterization of populations can be qualitative or quantitative. Quadrat sampling can be used to determine abundance, density, and distribution of species. What that means is that you look at kind of like what we did with the tree uh, when we did the carbon sequestration lab at the beginning of the year, right? You basically maybe look at, let's say, a certain uh, quadrant, right? A certain, let's say, 50 meters by 50 meters, whatever, and you count the abundance, density, and distribution of a species in that quadrant, and then you kind of expand that, extrapolate that over the entire area uh, to give you an idea uh, of, of the population size, the density, and where these species are distributed. Uh, Scientists also mark and recapture uh, sampling that is used to estimate the size of a population in a defined area, right? So uh, you mark the animal and then you recapture it uh, sometime later, kind of see where it went. Nowadays, they have tracking GPS uh, devices on a lot of these uh, markings that they put on organisms. And then you can kind of see uh, where those organisms happen to move uh, throughout, throughout the year. All right, so back to population here now. Several factors can limit population size. So each population has a range of tolerance. This is the variation in the physical and chemical environment under which it can survive. That's its range of tolerance, and we'll talk a little bit about it more in just a second. I have some graphs to show you. All right, some limiting factors. Again, limiting factors basically are factors that limit population size, right? So precipitation on land, all right, would limit population uh, size, right? We don't get a lot of organisms living in the desert. We got a lot in those tropical rainforests, right? So the more water you have, usually the more organisms, the less usually uh, less water, usually less organisms. Uh, the temperature of water, depth, clarity, and other factors in aquatic environments, right? Like your dissolved oxygen, for instance. And the population density could be limiting factors, uh, density density dependent factors, we're going to learn in a, in a couple of units that when you have a population that is very dense, when you get disease, uh, that's going to kill off a lot more of that population than if the population is widely dispersed, right? Uh, we So things to think about uh, when it comes to limiting factors for population size. So uh, this is the range of tolerance uh, for trout um, and changes in water temperature. So what does this tell us? This tells us that when the water temperature is too low, you have a zone of intolerance, you're gonna get no trout, okay? The, the water temperature begins to warm up, but it's still rather low. You get the zone of, of physiological stress, which means you'll get a couple of, of trout to grow in here. All right, maybe they can handle, maybe they're a little better adapted, whatever, they have a, have a mutation that allows them to handle a little bit colder water. You'll notice though, here's your uh, tolerance 
this is where you want to be if you're a trout, right? Between this water temperature and this water temperature here, whatever it happens to be. This is where you have all your organisms, right? That's your range of tolerance. Then you have at the higher end, higher water temperature, some few organisms in that zone of physiological stress. And then obviously when the water gets way too hot, higher limit of your tolerance, you're not going to get any trout, okay? So again, these are the, uh, here is the range of tolerance for water temperature. Uh, we could go, we could look at dissolved oxygen for trout. Uh, we could look at a turbidity of the water for trout. And again, they're all going to have uh, some kind of optimum range where they, most of the organisms can survive. Then as you get away from that optimum range, uh, the number of organisms that can survive uh, become fewer and fewer. But no population can grow indefinitely. So we're going to talk now about J curves and S curves uh, when they come to population growth. So some species can reproduce exponentially. They reproduce at an early age. They have many offspring each time they reproduce. They uh, have short intervals in, in between their reproductive cycles. Uh, examples of this are bacteria and most of your insect species. And they produce a J-shaped curve of growth. All right, so what does that look like? That looks like here on the left, a J, right? It looks like a J, okay? A J-sized, uh, a J uh, growth pattern basically means population size grows exponentially, right? Very quickly, all right? Starts off kind of slow, but then as you get more and more, uh, the population increases, basically, boom, you get an explosion of population, okay? The one on the right here is called an S-curve, all right? We're going to come back to this in a second because I want to now talk about the S-curve. So population growth in nature is always limited, all right? So this J-curve here doesn't really happen in nature. It may begin, okay, but then something is going to happen to change that J-curve. So environmental resistance, the sum of all the factors that limit population growth. And now here's that term carrying capacity. I know we've used it before, but now we're really going to talk about it. Is the maximum population of a given species that a particular habitat can sustain indefinitely. So it's basically, uh, it's a combination of the population of the species and the amount of resources available in that habitat. Obviously, in all habitats, there's only a certain uh, 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 a certain uh a certain uh, resources that you can that you can have, right? Eventually, the resources are going to run out. So that's what carrying capacity is all about. And if a population overshoots their carrying capacity, then you get a population crash because there's no longer any resources to support the population. This produces a S curve. So let's go back to the S curve. So what happens in the S curve is that first you get this exponential growth. It's a J, right? But then it ends up flattening out and it ends up looking like an S because what happens is we get to the carrying capacity, which again are those limiting factors. Has to maybe deal with the resources. Maybe it has to do with the temperature or, or salinity of, of, of the water. And so what happens is as the growth gets to the carrying capacity, it overshoots it, but then there aren't enough resources to support that amount of population. So the population crashes a little bit, but then it gets below the carrying capacity, right? So then you can increase the population, then decrease. So then over time, what you basically have is the population kind of just going up and down uh, along that carrying capacity line, okay? So that's your S curve. So again, J curve is an uh, exponential indefinite population growth, really doesn't happen in nature because of the Eventually, you get to that carrying capacity, which again, that habitat can no longer support the number of organisms that are there. And so then you see the, the growth curve kind of just hover right around that carrying capacity uh, as we go into the future. That's also what we're looking at here, okay? This was actually the reindeer population on a small Bering Sea island of St. Paul in 1910. So what happened was they introduced some of these uh, reindeer into this, uh, into this uh, habitat here on this small island. You'll notice the carrying capacity is this of number of reindeer is this orange line here. So that's really only what the habitat can handle, could only really handle maybe, what is that, about 90 to 100 reindeer, right? So what happened was they introduced these reindeer and they ended up having exponential growth over about 30 years. Incredible. 
But then the population overshot that carrying capacity so much that within, look at this, within 11 years, the population totally crashed to below that carrying capacity once again, all right? And this is what we see happening a lot in nature, that exponential growth starts, but then we get above the carrying capacity, the habitat can't support, all right, the number of species, the number in this case of reindeer, and so then the reindeer population crashes because there's no resources to support that many reindeer, and it crashes back down to the carrying capacity, and then I would argue hovers right around that carrying capacity as, as time moves forward. So uh, talking now, moving on to some reproductive patterns, we need to talk about R-selected and K-selected species. R-selected species are species with a capacity for a high rate of population growth. So algae, bacteria, frogs, insects, many fish. They may go through irregular and unstable cycles in their population sizes, but they can have a high rate of population growth. K-selected species are us. They are species that reproduce later in life. They have few offspring. They have long lifespans. So large mammals like human beings, right? Whales, uh, there are humans. Birds of prey and long-lived plants are K-selective species. However, K-selective species can be vulnerable to extinction, like the panda, okay, because uh, they don't have that many offspring, uh, and because they produce later in life, they are more vulnerable to extinction than your R-selected species, which just can produce reproduce over and over and over again, okay? Think of insects, all right? So insects are selected, human beings K-selected uh, species. I would definitely have a general idea of this chart, okay? So reproductive potential, high in R-selected, low in K. Population growth rate, fast in R-selected, slow in the K-selected. Time to reproductive maturity, R-selected, they get there very quick. K selected long, right? Takes human beings 14, 15 years. Number of reproductive cycles, many for R selected, much fewer for K selected. Number of offspring, many for R, few for K. Size of offspring, R selected are small. K selected are usually larger, right? Many K selected species birth them, birth the, the species, right? No eggs are laid. They birth, uh, birth uh, a, a, a grown species, maybe not fully grown, uh, but they're much, much larger. Uh, degree of parental care, low for R selected, right? Insects don't care for their young. High for K selected, we care for our young. Lifespan, short with R, long with K. Population size, variable with crashes for R. K selected, stable nearing the carrying capacity, and the role in the environment, R selected are usually prey, while your K selected species are usually your predators, okay? So definitely understand this chart and the difference between those R selected and K selected species. All right, so case study, exploding white tear deal population in the U.S., 1900, deer habit destruction and uncontrolled hunting in the 20s and 30s, laws to protect deer, uh, current deer population explo explosion in suburban areas. You draw, drive the Sawmill Parkway, uh, you know all the deer that are out there. Uh, this has increased deer vehicle collisions and increased Lyme disease because ticks uh, from deer, you get them, you can get Lyme disease. Uh, various methods out there to control the deer population, uh, but again, this is this is an issue. This guy, uh, we see him all over the place. I got a six pointer that actually lives in my backyard. A pointer is how many of these little uh, nubs you see on the on the horns. Okay, uh, the bigger the animal, or the more older the male is, usually they have more points. Um, so I actually got a six pointer that lives in my in my yard. He has about seven or eight females that he kind of uh, that's under his control, uh, and uh, they're all over the place. So again, we do have this ex exploding white tailed uh, tail deal population uh, in the United States. All right. So last thing we need to talk about is a survivorship curve. What that looks like. This shows the percentage of members of population surviving at different ages. So K selected species are going to have late loss, meaning uh, their organisms are going to die later in life. Our selected species are going to have early loss, which means most of their organisms die early in life. And then songbirds, squirrels, some organisms have what's known as a constant loss. So taking a look at the curve, these are your survivorship curves, okay? You'll notice first your early loss down here. Here they have an example of uh, dandelions, but again, this could be any insect. Uh, think about it. Insects, 
are hatched, right? Very quickly, many of them die. Either they don't make it or, or a, a bird or an animal sitting there. The minute the insects hatch, they, they eat up they eat up all the insects, right? But what do insects do? They produce so many offspring so that hopefully a few make it to older age, reproduce to start the cycle all over again, okay? But again, our, our selected species are going to have an early loss in their survivorship curve, meaning the things are going to be born, a lot of them are going to die very early on, and then the, the few that do remain and survive are the ones that reproduce. Constant loss, like a squirrel, or in the uh, case on the slide before, some songbirds, basically just uh, lose the same amount throughout any stage of the life. So the same amount of organisms die early on as die in middle age, as die in old age. And then you have our case-selected species. Again, here is an elephant. But we can think of human beings and what happens. Luckily, nowadays, most humans that are born uh, live, right? They live, live, live. And then when they get older, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, they die off. Okay, so you have late loss, meaning lots of survivors early to middle age, and then the crash as the uh, organism gets older towards old age. Again, that would be more of your K-selected species. Okay, so understand uh, these survivorship curves and how to read them. Humans are not exempt from nature's population controls. So uh, this is actually the last slide, just talks about in Ireland, potato crop destroyed by fungus in 1845, killed 1 million people. The bubonic plague killed 25 million during the 14th century. Uh, 21st century, we have COVID, right? Uh, luckily, we've come up with uh, ways to, uh, like, like a vaccine, they didn't have vaccines for the plague back in uh, the 14th century that has helped uh, not have as many people die. But hey, COVID is uh, uh, one of nature's population controls. These, uh, these are coronaviruses. Technological, social, and cultural changes have expanded Earth's carrying capacity for human species today. But on sport, unfortunately, we need to continue to expand the carrying capacity on Earth as our population continues to grow. And again, we're going to need our, 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 our technology uh, and our social and cultural changes to help continue to expand Earth's carrying capacity so that us humans uh, don't see a, a population crash uh, in the future. All right, so that ends my lecture on Chapter 7, Species Interactions, Ecological Succession, and Population Control. And as always, thanks for listening.